Good evening, you're watching Beyond Dispatch with me, Bhairavi Singh. The latest now on Gaza and well, Israel's Defense Minister, Avigdor Lieberman, has resigned as the Netanyahu government has agreed to a ceasefire with the Hamas. Now, the Defense Minister says the ceasefire is a surrender to terror. The Egypt brokered ceasefire between Israel and Gaza has evoked mixed responses from Israelis and the Palestinians. On the one hand, angry Israeli protesters took to the streets of the bombarded southern villages and blocked to traffic junction. Many even burnt tires in protest at what they deemed was government surrender. People here just had enough. They had enough. We don't have any security, any confidence. Uh, it's amazing that, uh, you know, we're such a strong country. We have all the abilities to strike Hamas within a day. And, and just losers. But in Gaza City, many Palestinians welcomed relative calm. Locals were out on the streets to celebrate, claiming victory and handing out sweets to the crowds as well. Hamas and its other allies announced an Egyptian brokered ceasefire with Israel late on Tuesday after an intense escalation of violence that killed at least seven Palestinians. And Daniele Pagani, our Bureau Chief for West Asia, is now joining us live. He's on his way to Gaza and is now joining us. And Daniele, uh, even as many were celebrating that finally that there's been a ceasefire uh, between Israel and Palestinians uh, and, and, you know, there's been a bloody war that's been unfolding since March. Now the surprise move by the Defense Minister, which could even threaten Netanyahu's government. It was pretty, pretty clear since the first hour after a very long cabinet, security cabinet meeting on yesterday that the defense minister did not share the same position of the prime minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, when it comes to the ceasefire. The ceasefire, as you pointed out, yes, is good news for citizens of both sides, both within Gaza and from Israel, because it means that there is no active hostility as of now. But many, and the defense minister is one of them, consider the reaction that Israel took on Gaza, and not only this current reaction, but the course of action that Israel took against Hamas in Gaza to mild, they would like a stronger response. Uh, so in many of the observers of Israeli politics uh, were kind of expecting some reshuffles within the government. It remains now to be seen who is up for the post of the Ministry of Defense. Uh, many think that Mr. Bennett, currently the education minister, uh, who stands to the right wing, I would say, of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, a religious oriented right wing, is the next in line. But it is not an easy job to take up the Defense Ministry of Israel as of now, with this very fragile ceasefire on. Right, Daniele, thanks very much indeed for joining us live there. Daniele is on his way to Gaza and will be sending us the latest updates through uh, the evening and through the night as well. Daniele, thanks very much indeed. Now, the other big story, of course, there has finally been a breakthrough after a year. Britain has agreed to a draft Brexit deal with the European Union, but Theresa May's troubles don't really end here. They, in fact, may just begin. Uh, Prime Minister Theresa May still has to get through her cabinet and a deeply divided parliament. Well, that parliament session, of course, is ongoing as we speak, uh, and many questions uh, is what she is facing in the House before she briefs her cabinet on the draft deal at 10 Downing Street. You can hear the, uh, some of the audio off and back and forth between Theresa May, uh, which she faced earlier today in parliament just minutes ago, and the opposition was unsparing in its attack. Two years of bungled negotiations. From what we know, from what we know of the government's deal, it's a failure in its own terms. It doesn't deliver a Brexit for the whole country. It breaches. If necessary, I'll say it again and again to members on both sides of the House. Voices must be heard. I happen to know that there are visitors from overseas in the gallery. Let's try to impress them. Order, not merely with our liveliness, but with our courtesy. Mr Jeremy Corbyn. 
It breaches the Prime Minister's own red lines. It doesn't deliver a strong economic deal that supports jobs and industry. And we know they haven't prepared seriously for no deal. So does the Prime Minister still intend to put a false choice to Parliament between her botched deal or no deal? Yeah. Prime Minister! to the right honourable gentleman that he's wrong in the description that he set out. But can I also say to him, time and time again, he has stood up in this House and complained and said that the government isn't making progress, the government isn't anywhere close to a deal. Now when we're making progress and close to a deal, he's complaining about that. Can I just say, I think, I think what that clearly shows is that he and the Labour Party have only one intention, that is to frustrate Brexit and betray the vote of the British people. Jeremy Corbyn! Well, Mr Speaker, after the utter shambles of the last two years of negotiations, yeah. the Prime Minister should look to herself in this. Yeah. And she hasn't managed to convince quite a lot of people behind her. Yeah. The Rail Minister... The Rail Minister resigned last week saying to present the nation with a choice between two deeply unattractive outcomes, vassalage and chaos, is a failure of British statecraft on a scale unseen since the Suez Crisis. And that from a Tory MP. Yeah. Last night, the EU's lead Brexit negotiator reportedly told the 27 European ambassadors the UK must align their rules, but the EU will retain all the control. Is that a fair summary of the Prime Minister's deal? Prime Minister! Can I say to the right honourable gentleman, as I have said all along throughout these negotiations, what we are doing is negotiating a good f deal for the United Kingdom. We're negotiating, we're negotiating a deal that delivers on the vote of the British people, that takes back control of our money, law and borders, that ensures we leave the common fisheries policy, we leave the customs union, we leave the common agricultural policy. We protect, we protect jobs, we protect security and we protect the integrity of the United Kingdom. All right, those heated exchanges in that special address to Parliament by Theresa May just a few minutes ago. And Mandy Clark, my colleague, is joining us live from London now for more on the possibilities of what could really happen. And Mandy, well, what an exchange that was between the Prime Minister and, of course, Jeremy Corbyn of the opposition. And the good news in this, of course, was there's a draft deal that has been put in place. But the biggest challenge for Theresa May is still right there. And it is hard-selling uh, hard, hard for her, both in Parliament and within her cabinet. And as you noticed in that exchange, a lot of posturing, a lot of grandstanding, but no details. We have no idea what is in this um, negotiation deal that she's going to first put forward to her cabinet uh, at two o'clock local time. That's just over an hour and a quarter here in London. And First, her toughest audience will, of course, be her cabinet. There is a lot of uh, signs of positivity. Uh, while a lot of these uh, Tory cabinet members arrived at work today, uh, when journalists ask them, what do you make of the deal? They say, I don't know. I haven't read it yet. So uh, that will be decided. Um, some Tory politicians have even said, you know, don't don't make dinner plans. This will be an all night affair when they're they're going back and forth. Certainly on the European side, they feel like this is a deal that they um, agree with and they can get forward to. But it's going to take a lot for Theresa May just to get it by her own cabinet. And if miraculously they do support it, she'll need to push it through Parliament. Now, in all likelihood, Labour is not going to support it, but she will need support from the DUP. And those are the uh, the small party in Northern Ireland that are holding her up and they say they don't like the deal. Mm -hmm. So it's very troubled times ahead for Mrs May. Well, absolutely. Very troubled times. And Mandy, very shortly then, of course, this could, as you pointed out, throw up many scenarios ranging from a calm divorce, which looks like a miracle at this point, the economy really sinking. And of course, uh, Theresa May's uh, prime ministerial ship also uh, at stake here. Absolutely. I think this is going to be her greatest test because not only if it fails to go through Parliament, that it will be um, that will likely trigger a leadership election that it shows that her own party has lost faith in her and there will be a leadership election. It's the last thing you need at the minute as we 
go down final months to Brexit. So uh, it's really crunch time. And if she passes the test with her own cabinet, she's going to have to pass the parliamentary test. If she fails there, she can lose her position. Mm -hmm. It's uh, all it's a, it's very challenging. We'll have to see. Well, it's all up in the air at this point. Thanks, Mandy Clark, for joining us live there from London. Well, the other big story today, Sri Lanka's parliament passed a no-confidence motion against the newly appointed Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapakse uh, today, presenting a standoff with the opposition and throwing the country deeper into turmoil, many believe. Sri Lanka's MPs passed the no-confidence motion amid a voice vote which was drowned in chaos in parliament. The 225-member strong assembly was adjourned after the speaker declared Rajapakse's loss. The onus is now on President Sri Sena to pick a new Prime Minister. Now, the deputies from Rajapakse's party rejected the voice vote as illegal, saying it wasn't scheduled and that the former strongman would remain in office. Rajapakse and his legislator, son Namal, uh, walked out of the chambers just before the speakers called for, speaker called for the voice vote. Members of Parliament loyal to Rajapakse attempted to grab the mace, the symbol of authority of the legislature, to disrupt the vote. But the speaker went ahead with the voice vote still and the result does not automatically of course mean that Ranele Vikramasinghe has won the constitutional showdown. Ranil Vikramasinghe took to Twitter to declare victory. He tweeted and I quote, we will now take steps to ensure that the government is in place before 26th uh, 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 before the 26th of October will continue, I wish to inform all government servants and police that you cannot carry out any illegal orders from the purported uh, government that has failed to demonstrate confidence of the people. And we'll listen in to what Sri Lankan MP and leader from the Tamil National Alliance had to say on the vote. All the actions were in contravention of the constitution of the country. They violated the country's constitution. And we, on the basis of a policy decision, decided, the Tamil National Alliance, that we, we will oppose such actions on the part of the executive. We went to court. The first petition filed in the Supreme Court, challenging the order of dissolution of parliament, was filed by me on behalf of my party. That matter was taken up for inquiry yesterday and the court has suspended the operation of that gazette declaration, the operation of the resolution of parliament and the consequential steps pertaining to the election. We have thereby preserved the sanctity of the constitution, the supreme law of the country. We have thereby ensured that the rule of law prevails in this country. The independence of the judiciary has been demonstrated by the judiciary yesterday. And while joining us live now is Harsha De Silva, who is the State Minister for National Policies in the UNP uh, and a UNP MP as well. And Harsha De Silva, thanks very much for talking to us this evening. Now, the Rajapaksa side has not accepted the voice vote. Has uh, the political crisis in Sri Lanka only deepened? What happens next from here? Well, Rajapaksa camp should accept it. They were there and a vote was taken. We attempted to take a vote by division, by but that was blocked. Nevertheless, the speaker has, we understand now, uh, and, uh, uh, the sent the minutes, uh, what happened in parliament to President Sirisena. So the President Sirisena will have to act according to the constitution and, um, um, and appoint a new uh, prime minister uh, and uh, the uh, government, um, cabinet of ministers. Right. Uh, Harsha De Silva, uh, I, I'm afraid your line to us is very weak, so we will try and patch you again later. But, uh, uh, but Harsha De Silva, they're pointing out that uh, the political crisis uh, has abated as of now. Uh, and what happens next, of course, we will see in the course of time. Thanks very much indeed for that. Well, in other news now, India has raised the issue of Pakistan's sponsored terror with the United States at the highest level during a meeting between the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi and the U.S. Vice President Mike Pence on the sidelines of the East Asia Summit. This was the first high-level U.S.-India talk since the signing of the S-400 missile deal with Russia. The two leaders also spoke about the sticky issues like the H-1B visa, trade, 
energy needs, the Prime Minister remarked that in the last two years since President Trump assumed office, American exports to India have grown by 50 percent. They also discussed import of oil and gas worth four billion from the U.S. as the two leaders emphasized on the need to enhance energy cooperation. we have important issues to discuss. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, the President and I are truly grateful uh, for your strong support uh, of uh, a free and open Indo-Pacific and the recent naval exercises between India, Japan and the United States. Also give evidence of our mutual commitment uh, to ensuring uh, free and open access to the seas uh, all across this region and we're grateful for your leadership uh, and the collaboration that is represented uh, uh, in those defense efforts. Well, Prime Minister Modi also invited Vice President Mike Pence to visit India. The meeting assumes significance in the wake of the U.S. granting India a waiver for buying crude oil from Iran. India is also expected to push U.S. to grant it a waiver for the purchase of the seven S-400 air defense missile systems from Russia as well. Earlier, U.S. had threatened sanctions against India over the deal. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Modi, along with leaders from U.S., Japan and Australia, will also attend the third round of the quadrilateral dialogue on the side lines of the summit. Vice President Pence referred to the coming 10th anniversary of the Mumbai uh, terror attacks, which is the 26th of November, 2611. Uh, in this context, he greatly appreciated the cooperation that had been built between the United States and India on counter-terrorism. Uh, and in response, the Prime Minister, while thanking him for these words, also reminded him that uh, 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 in one way or another, uh, all the traces and all the leads uh, in global terror attacks ultimately lead to a single source, to a single place of origin. Uh, and in that context, he did point out that uh, the mainstreaming of uh, people involved in the Mumbai terror attacks in a political process which had taken place during the recent elections in Pakistan should be a matter of serious concern not just to uh, the two countries that is India and the United States but to the international community. Uh, the Indo-Pacific did come up for discussion. Uh, Prime Minister referred to his speech here in Singapore in June at the Shangri-La Dialogue uh, in which he had outlined India's vision on the Indo-Pacific. Uh, we uh, conveyed to Pres Vice President Pence that uh, his vision of the Indo-Pacific was gaining acceptability uh, and that we should utilize the forthcoming East Asia Summit uh, to further build upon that.